impressive. The people working in the mine that I talked to are proud of the fiat, and they should be. It's really very amazing. Our culture has decided on the dollar as a unit of measure of worth for almost everything except, as the saying goes, putting a price on love. The dollar is a measure of business and transaction. It was originally conceived of for that purpose and remains as its purpose. It is a measure of power which is traded back and forth as an exchange of energy, life energy. I give you $20 worth of my life energy for this object, and uh, which you and I agree took $20 of your life energy to produce, or more or less, depending upon how much I want it and how much you want to sell it. I work for an hour for this university. I get to store somewhere an hour's worth of my life energy in an account. Apparently some people's life energy is worth more than an hour of my life, and some are worth less. Some are worth much less, apparently. The use of monetary currency as a measure of the value of nature is inherently biased against keeping nature as it is and biased towards using nature for economic development, even at the level of green economy. The questions usually go towards how many jobs are created, how many dollars will be saved after all is said and done, how much income will be created for the local economy, how many six days and therefore dollars will be saved if we leave the wilderness alone for recreation and psychological relief. These are very short-term questions, but they fit well into spreadsheets. They can be summed and ratioed and compared. As long as the playing field upon which nature is being examined, then development, as long as this is the playing field, then development, conquer, and use have the advantage. The questions being asked now are those which, of course, must be asked until our various cultures have evolved to the point where our philosophies take into account more than economics and the pioneering conquest spirit, as outlined so well in Robert Nash's Wilderness in the American Mind. The wilderland are not merely the visual. It is the sound, the smell, the taste, the physical feel of an area. It is even more than that. It is the visceral feel of an area. It is an entire experience. The gestalt, which has no counterpart in our normal languages. It cannot be measured using a quantifiable set of units. To list the hard data, catalogs, a part of a character, an area's character, and perhaps worth. The more visceral, the more abstract, the soft data is fully half of the description of an area of nature or of a life. This is the realm of the arts and the humanities. To communicate and, in a different way, measure the worth of a place, of a life, of an experience. The sciences parse the whole into the pieces. The arts and the humanities do the opposite. Both inspect and try to understand, predict, and hopefully communicate. Both are needed in order to decide the worth of nature, to make a decision on the type of use of nature using only hard data without the use of soft data, is to decide based on only partial information, and as such, likely to be erroneous. Is the desert experience as valuable if the visual is kept but the overwhelming silence is lost? Is a temperate rainforest as awe-inspiring if the undergrowth in the timber is thinned? Is it still the same experience with the same worth? Is our right to exist as we choose worth more than the rights of other species, life forms, inanimate forms? Can you indeed put a price on love? For what is it, or for that is what it may come down to, love and compassion may be a missing piece of the formula. I have a $20 bill. I have one from each gender. I'm almost done. I transfer that $20 bill to you and to you. You each now have $10. <laughs> or simply two pieces of colored paper. The whole is greater than the mere sum of the parts. Thank you. Okay, you can keep the twenty dollars, and now it's tax deductible. <laughs> Looks like uh, right on the clock. Uh, they must be looking for going to another class. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Center of Excellence for Arts and Humanities uh, for organizing uh, this kind of program, and I hope 
you keep on doing this kind of uh, uh, keep on enhancing this kind of activity it's good for all of us to understand at least uh, one part of the puzzle uh, nature uh, I'm an engineer and uh, uh, I think uh, what I did uh, I prepared my presentation uh, right uh, uh, according to the questions we were given and uh, so I thought I will uh, 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 give you what were the questions posed uh, to the panel. One of the questions was, the first one, uh, constructive, healthy use of non-human nature. Well, I have to agree with uh, uh, my other colleagues. Uh, I do not think uh, there is any such thing which we call non-human nature. Uh, well, that's what I think, unless uh, uh, we go to the Greenland or Antarctica, where uh, it's uh, almost impossible for the humans to survive. Uh, the reason I say is uh, humans are part of, uh, uh, we are all, we are part of one of the species on the planet, and we are part of the ecosystem. So my hypothesis is we are part of the nature. Uh, we can go back to history. Uh, part of the discussion might be coming that uh, we as humans uh, might be uh, encroaching uh, to areas where we are spoiling the nature, the water, air, soil. But we can go to the history of the humanity or the planet and you'll find several examples where we have, uh, we have lost uh, our civilizations and we don't know exactly uh, what, are the, what were the, some of the reasons. But we know some that uh, either there might be an epidemic of a disease or we lost uh, part of the natural resources, uh, which could be water, or uh, our soil became saline because of over-irrigation, or we started over-digging soil or over-cultivating and uh, soil erosion came to that point that uh, life could not uh, sustain on that part of the planet. But uh, let us take an example just for the sake of argument um, that uh, some of the uh, wilderness, uh, forest areas, are part of the non-human nature. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the healthy uses of non-human nature for the humans? I don't think we can survive without forest either. We all uh, understand pretty well. Uh, forests are the source of fuel. Uh, they provide timber uh, for our homes. In many parts of the world, uh, without forest, we cannot cook even evening meals. And uh, forests are rich resources of several uh, medicine values, uh, plus house or home for millions of species, plants and animals uh, both. But I think uh, uh, the argument is uh, even that part of the non-nature uh, environment, uh, we have to share equally uh, if we argue equal opportunity for all on this planet. Uh, my definition for nature is uh, uh, soil, water, and air, because I'm an applied scientist, and that's the area I work with. And I think I can justify when we say soil, water, and air, it's part of, most of the planet is part of it. Uh, and uh, another argument is, uh, sometimes we might say, uh, no, uh, we can go back to rivers and oceans. These are also some of the uh, environmental part of the nature which are uh, non-human, but uh, I think uh, uh, we are uh, sharing and taking care of uh, that part also. Other question we were uh, given, economic consequences of human or non-use of uh, natural resources. Um, it brings a dilemma how we treat natural resources. Uh, some of my colleagues had a project in Mexico. In Mexico, uh, I think the hypothesis is uh, it's a God-given gift, and it should be free for all. Even if uh, some of these small communities or some of the towns are trying to treat water and supplying clean water to the homes, homeowners will not pay the bills because they don't believe in it. So I think uh, that is uh, one part of the economics, but uh, being uh, a water person, uh, it is a renewable resource, but uh, if you look at the total availability of water, 97.2% uh, of the water on the planet is saline, which we cannot use beneficially as humans. Of course, unless we want to use some of the sea 
food. The remaining 2.8% uh, of the water uh, which uh, is available, uh, about 1.6% uh, of that, 2.8% is kind of tapped in glaciers, North and South Pole. So only 0.8%, less than 1% of the water which flows in the rivers, in the groundwater lakes, is available for humanity, as well as for the wildlife, which are part of the nature. So if we don't take care of that 0.8% of the water, we don't preserve the quality, we don't have equal distribution in terms of availability, I think uh, we are having a risk. But uh, why we are thinking we are having a risk, as I gave you an example, historically, it has happened before. So we are passing through a period of correctness. We overload the system due to pollution, and we have the knowledge, uh, we have the capacity to correct it. So we are correcting it as it, uh, as it passes through. Other part of the water is availability, what we have done to our natural systems. We all know uh, Colorado River does not reach the ocean. Yellow River in China, it reaches the ocean once every 12 years. 11 years is dried up. There are examples of Aral Sea in Central Asia. The two major rivers which are feeding the Aral Sea, they don't feed anymore. And the water level in the ocean of Aral Sea has gone down by 70 feet in 30 years. So those are the, some of the damages we might have caused, but we also know how to correct those damages. So I think there are pluses and uh, minuses uh, which we can all uh, uh, understand, uh, but again, uh, that is uh, part of the system uh, we live in. Sometimes uh, we hear the uh, several headlines in newspapers that water supplies are finite. It is correct. But there are few countries like Canada, Austria, and Brazil. They will never run out of water unless something drastic happens. But uh, uh, again, uh, those are the, some of the examples I'm trying to give you. And a third question was spiritual uh, value of non-human nature. There are several societies uh, on the planet. They treat water differently. They worship water. India is one example. There are several, uh, uh, I gave you an example of Mexico. It's a God-given gift. Uh, but at the same time, if you sit uh, on the bank of river alone and look at the therapy, mental therapy you are going to have, that is the connected, uh, your connectivity with nature. So there are benefits of nature, but you got to find. You don't have to go to forest. You can sit right next to Lake Laverne and enjoy nature. Sometimes you feel like the nature is only where there are no humans, which I tend to uh, disagree. Uh, what are the potential, of, uh, uh, fourth question was, unlimited potential of human uses of nature, I agree. Nature provides a tremendously untapped, unlimited resource. What is air, water, soil? Um, we hear that the, word, uh, the, uh, the uh, number of people on the planet uh, are exploding, <coughs> and that's true. It, you, if you look at very negatively, sometimes we hear that we want our planet will not be able to produce enough food to feed all these people. I tend to disagree. We as humans have capacity to feed even two to three times of the population we have right now, provided we know how to manage our natural resources. And finally, the question was, uh, how as, my, as a faculty member drive my research agenda on the campus? Well, these are the opportunities. When uh, I'm working with the environment, uh, soil, water, and air, and uh, if I look at negatively, uh, these are getting contaminated, and that drives my research agenda, that drives my teaching agenda. But I look more positively. These are the opportunities uh, we have to uh, follow and create for the future. So let us look at nature. We are, uh, if you look at uh, million of, millions of years of planet, and we have might have created a correctness factor within past 50 years. You might say our population is exploding, our natural resources are getting contaminated. It's a very small segment of the life cycle. But I can assure you, we may not be here, but in the next 50 years, we are going to correct all these symptoms which we call are damaging 
uh, the nature. And finally, I'm going to say uh, nature is very powerful at the time. Uh, the technology is very powerful, and we as one of the species on the planet are very powerful. So we got to learn how to live with nature, but we are part of nature. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl, for inviting me to this. Um, and I want to warn you that you're going to have to probably throw something at me because I'm not going to be able to really see you from here at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. I'm a historian. And one thing I've learned over time is that early on in my graduate career, somebody showed me a quote. I cannot remember who said it anymore, but thinking historically is an unnatural act. And it's something that comes back to me on a daily basis, and especially when I listen to these conversations. For me, the most important things are context and contingency. Unlike a lot of my colleagues at this university or any university, I think about the specificity and uniqueness of moments, not the transcendent. I want to understand how any given moment in any lived life separates itself from others, how life ends up being a series of discrete experiences as well as uh, larger patterns. As a result, I spent a lot of time asking very basic journalistic questions, like who, what, when, where, why. As I listened to Scott discuss our environmental dilemma, I was struck again by the way in which the suburban experience has been globalized as our environmental dilemma. And it's not that I disagree with many of his critiques, but what I want to do is point out the specificity of experience. As the critique has been laid out, not only by Scott, but by many, many environmentalists over the last several decades, in essence, the critique ends up being that work closes us off from nature and play opens it up. Play, though, I would argue, opens up a much more constrained sort of experience with nature. And there are ways in which I'll try to explain this later. But one of the things I'm also struck by is that the environmental experiences are much broader than what we've been talking about here. And I want to take you through some of the things that I see in my daily life. There's a guy here. I come to work early in the morning. And there's a guy who shows up here about 6 o'clock every morning riding on a bicycle to deliver the newspaper. Every morning. Every morning. Think about that. The middle of winter. This is a guy who's doing it. He's doing a Herculean job out here. And he, every morning, is riding his bike to deliver these things. He has an unmediated experience with nature that I would dearly love to avoid the rest of my life. <laughs> I see students who are rushing out to their cars in the middle of winter to start their car, who get an experience with nature that I am glad not to have because my car is parked in a garage that walls it off. I think about the Latinos who work in the meat packing plants around the state, who have an unex unmediated experience with nature that I desperately hope my daughter and everybody else never gets. I think about Colville Indians on the, in eastern Washington who are still hoping to get running water to some of their places, who have an unmediated experience with nature they never want to have. The point is that sometimes when we talk about our experiences in nature and the ones we yearn for, we talk about wilderness and wildlife, of wolves and old growth forests, of salmon and undammed streams. But there are other people who talk about forms of wildlife, other forms of environmental problems that have to do with rats and cockroaches and things that we measure in parts per million and parts per billion. Another way in which I think about this is the aboriginal groups. Oftentimes, aboriginal groups stand for a sort of pristine and idealized relationship to nature. As a historian, I know that there are problems with this, dating not only from the Holocene extinctions, but even to places like the Hohokam irrigation canals that sal and salinization destroyed a population before Europeans ever arrived here. A buffalo ju jumps where Plains Indians were destroying far more <coughs> buffalo than they could ever consume. And of my, my Indians that I write about time and again having to do with salmon, there are people who would take extraordinary measures to venerate the fish at certain moments in the year. And then when the ceremonial period was over, they were literally throwing them over both shoulders because they needed to catch a lot of fish before the winter arrived. 
Sometimes people venerate nature. Sometimes the mystical parts of nature move forward. But then the context shifts and a different relationship emerges. Humans have complicated relationships with nature. When we tell those stories, we end up either opening up or closing off those experiences. When I listen to Scott, he talks about our environmental experiences and our environmental values. And I desperately want to ask whose, when, where, why. Those seem to me the critical issues now as in throughout history. When I read Terry Tempest Williams, or Barry Lopez, or Wendell Berry, I see one set of stories emerge forward. I see people who are extremely eloquent in speaking for particular environmental values. When I read reports by ecologists about aspect and situatedness, by fisheries biologists about relationships between killer whales and the otters, or really boring stuff like halibut otoliths, geographers talking about the constructedness of space, atmospheric science, scientists talking about the southern oscillation, or El Nino. I see people who are once speaking and describing nature, but at the same time, I also see them oftentimes telling about their environmental experiences with these things. They relate to them not only by riding on boats and fishing and what have you, but they also relate to them through data. There's a tendency to use uh, the quantification of, uh, of life and the quantification of narrative structures as a way of diminishing what we understand, but in, sen in a sense, we cannot talk about something like El Nino outside of a quantification. There's no way to perceive it outside of instruments. In all these ways, I, th I think that the world is a little bit more complicated, that the way we tell stories ends up being far more complicated than we want. When I go home to the coast of Oregon and I listen to my buddies who are fishers and loggers and dairy farmers, and they tell me stories about their life in trucks and on boats and in bars, they speak about nature in a very, very different way from Terry Tempest Williams, but it's no less passionate. And in some ways, it's no less articulate. It just operates in a different world. For all these reasons, I want to step back and remind you that environmental research is interdisciplinary, but so is environmental activism. That we need to understand the world from a variety of different points. And one of the other things we need to do is start listening to a broader set of stories. And one of the problems that comes from this, though, is because our interests are so different, because our concerns are so different, that simply telling stories may not bind us in any easy way. We may not find that we end up at the same places. The hour in our environmental problems and our environmental values begins to break down. The environmental conversations, though, they matter. And they're worth talking about. They're worth telling stories. The stories can open or close. Part of how that operates, though, is based on the context, whether we're telling them to each other as a bunch of academic geeks sitting at a dinner, if we're in a policy debate fighting over finite resources, or if we're in a courtroom, which will constrain what we can say and what we can use as evidence in very different ways. The participants also matter. As I said, it's one thing for a group of people to get together who all agree on environmental issues, most of whom agree that things are not going right. It's a very different thing to move even from that, though, to saying what we can do, how we should do it, which we should take care of first. In all these ways, things become more and more complicated. The who, the what, the where, the why matter. And they matter now as they have mattered through history because they have shaped our experiences in radically different ways sometimes. Context and contingency need to be kept focusing. Thank you. What is nature worth? Number six. <laughs> How many of you are experiencing what we might consider mental fatigue? <laughs> it's the end of a long day. I'm, I'm struck as we're thinking about mental, as I'm thinking about mental fatigue, I'm looking at you a little fatigued. Uh, I'm reminded of this very interesting research by the Kaplans, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, psychologists, who have determined that if you guys go outside and experience what they call the nearby nature, yards, grass, shrubs, trees, maybe a forest, but it doesn't have to be a forest, it could just be a tree strip, 
outside your apartment building. If you go out and experience that, 20 minutes, half hour, and come back in, you will perform better on tests of creativity than if you did a whole bunch of other things for that half hour. Your mental juices will be restored. And creativity, vitality, your stress levels will go down, your blood chemistry will change. What is nature worth? Now, I hope nobody has to go have gallbladder surgery tomorrow. But if you did, the research has shown that if we take half of the gallbladder surgery people and we give them a window with a tree and the other half with a window with a brick wall, those who have a tree will need less pain medication, will go home sooner, will have fewer complications, and will experience less mental distress, call the nurse less while they're in the hospital. What is nature worth? It seems to me that we need to know more about this. And uh, I'm just fascinated by this research coming out of medical, public health uh, areas, and also psychology. And I came to my interest in these, what are to me as a social scientist, relatively invisible dimensions of our relationship to the natural world, physical and mental impacts that I didn't know anything about, and yet, when I tell them to you, you all sort of nod. You know, it's not really all that surprising. We know that we feel restored after a walk in the woods, but we don't really know a lot about that. And I think that's something we need to look into. And I came to that passionate fascination about this as a result of watching Emory faculty. Now, I work in a university that's in the city of Atlanta, a uh, poster child for sprawl, and we have begun to take more seriously our obligations to move toward a more sustainable world. And one of the things we have done is we've borrowed the format of a curriculum development project from Northern Arizona University. And I began to watch faculty that I know well. I've been there for a long time. I've seen a lot of different kinds of programs come and go. For two days, we asked faculty to give up in the summer, two days to be in a workshop, 20 faculty, about five facilitators. And at the end of that time, we asked them for feedback, and they said these very, very positive things. They said things like, this was the best faculty development activity I've participated in at Emory. This is the best workshop at Emory in my 14 years. It was an intellectual <coughs> feast. I learned a ton. Everything we did was important to me. This is not the cynical faculty that I know. These are not the board. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this is not the folks that I'm used to. So I began to get really curious about that. And I think this is really the heart of anthropology. We experience daily life. We experience what's going on in the lives of the people that we study. And we notice things because we're there. And I'm noticing these people are more excited. So um, a year after the first group had completed uh, what we now call the Piedmont Project, um, I started interviewing them to find out what was it that m mattered to you so much. And many of the things that the panelists said here tonight are what I hear from the people that I've talked with. First of all, what's so powerful about this experience is that it builds community. It allows a very, very diverse group of faculty, law, business, theology, public health, French, German, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, chemistry, biology, huge range of fields to come together and talk about teaching, which is something we don't talk about all that much. We do it all the time, but we often don't talk with each other about it. And then to experience nature. We had a series of lectures in which we learned about sprawl, and we learned about the land is heat island, and we learned how that kills people, and we learned about our our air quality, and we learned how that also uh, kills people sooner than they would otherwise die. And we learn about what is a watershed, and what is the Piedmont, and what are the native species for our area. And then at lunch, one of the ecologists takes us out in a forest right beside the building where we are having this meeting, and we experience 
nature, and we actually get refreshed and restored, and we come in more creative. And then the second day, we go down to a creek that's right below the building, and we walk around the creek, and we see the pollution in the water and the erosion of the stream banks, and we talk about macro invertebrates, and we have some learning about water quality and water issues in Atlanta. And the second thing that people told me, in addition to building community, which they hunger for, is that it grounds them in place. It gives them an experience of Atlanta that they didn't have. And here are some quotes. It was eye-opening for me. I never took ecology, said one natural scientist. And to sit down and hear from experts was a wonderful thing. The nature walks, I, really, I remember really enjoying that, telling me what the trees here are called. I knew nothing about the South when I came here. This was one of the best things for me, learning about the trees. And it was really interesting for me, uh, personally, is that I, I don't really want to know the names of trees sometimes. I, I found myself at, at times wanting to say to this ecologist, no, 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 don't drown them in the names. But, uh, but then I heard this person say, the most fun, memorable part for me was going on the hike, learning to identify native plants. It really did change the way I think. Down toward the village, now I notice the row of magnolias, and I think, there's a planted row. We have our own species of native magnolia grandiflora that we saw in our walk in Han Woods. I think that part of why the connection to place and building community is so powerful is that it does what Scott said, it speaks to our emotions. And I think the people who come together concerned about sustainability and trying to find ways in their own courses to help move that forward are, are acting on their deepest values. And they love, they love finding other people. This one guy says, the excitement of having all those people in all those disciplines interested in environmental issues, that was a huge thing for me. Said another faculty member, very quickly I felt I belonged with them and they with me. Even though it wasn't mentioned much, we had a kind of a cause. We all cared really passionately about something. And I enjoyed being a part of that movement. If Margaret Mead is right, and transformative change pretty much only comes about through the committed activities of small groups of people. How we nurture small groups of people matters. And this activity tonight is a really good example. The Piedmont Project at Demory is another way that we're trying to nurture small groups of people that can become more educated and knowledgeable and work together. And one institution at a time one university at a time, we may be able to move toward a different value of nature. Thank you. Very briefly, um, Cheryl has asked if, I'll, if I would give a brief response to the uh, other panelists and then open things up for questions. And, and after already exceeding my time limit, I don't want to speak too much longer. I'm sorry about that. But, um, let me just say a few things about part of what I've gleaned from these other presentations. First of all, I'm just fascinated by the overlappings and distinctions between the ways in which we all view the world. And I wish actually we had begun um, each of our presentations kind of in the manner that Jay did, where he defined himself as a historian. This is, this is how I think of history and how I view the world. I, I, I would be intrigued to hear each person on the panel um, and people representing other disciplines speak in that manner. Uh, it's really fascinating to me. Um, I, I, it was very helpful for me to hear Fred um, asking some of these big questions that he does so well and then bringing them into the more specific context of new ways of approaching agriculture. And one of the things that I wrote down on my, in my notes that, that I'm going to continue to reflect upon is this issue of how the modification of the environment affects the whole of nature. What, just what does it mean for us to modify uh, given that humans, like other organisms, will modify their immediate environment and, and have implications for, for the, the planet, what, what exactly is the influence of these changes upon the whole of, of the world? What are the vast sets of interconnections that we should keep in mind? And as I mentioned at our dinner conversation, this issue has been explored in a very interesting way in an essay by Wendell Berry called uh, Getting Along with Nature from his 
a book from the late 80s, uh, Home Economics. And I, was, I really appreciated many aspects of, of um, Ramesh's very obedient response to the original questions as he systematically worked through them. Uh, but I was particularly intrigued by the discussion of, of water and the information about available, usable water. And just, we think of the planet, this as being the planet of water with vast available water when actually from a technical engineering perspective, a, a very minute fraction of the planet's water is really uh, present and available for human use, for the sustaining, I think, not only of human life, but of all life forms on this planet. And that, for me, was a, a fascinating and sobering uh, statistic. I was fascinated by Steve's uh, very direct reflection on the meaning of the word worth, and you know his effort to explain what worth means, and, and then to display to us how arbitrary worth or value actually is, a uh, very graphic, uh, impressive presentation. It reminded me actually of a really intriguing essay called Money by the Australian essayist William Lines, L-I-N-E-S, from his 2001 book um, <coughs> called, called Open Air. Uh, William Lines is a very uh, cantankerous, provocative essayist, and the, the essay Money, he's one of the main Australian nature writers, Money talks about the, the problems that occur when we when we use monetary value as a way of measuring and determining the, the uh, merits or importance of nature um, and suggest that as soon as we enter into a monetary conversation about nature, we are making certain compromises um, about a, a phenomena that, that cannot, he argues, uh, readily be construed uh, as uh, economic uh, phenomena. Um, and then, uh, you know, I felt very uh, admonished and challenged by Jay's interesting comments about the, the problem with using uh, universal pronouns like our society and you know our language, um, the implications of our culture, and, and take to heart the suggestions that contingency and context are extremely important and, and find myself pondering how to do that as a literary scholar where so many of the authors I work with do speak in these universal pronouns attempting to, uh, to function as wisdom speakers or sages um, articulating perspectives uh, for uh, vast numbers of people who may not readily communicate their points of view. And I, I think, you know, uh, for myself, it's important for me to keep track of the multiplicity of voices that attempt in, in careful literary or other artistic ways to uh, synthesize not only their own experience but other people's experiences within their communities. Um, but I, I, I still feel admonished to try to think about the uh, kinds of perspectives and voices that may come from people who are, are non-artists, non-academics, non-writers, and how these work their way into the environmental discussions. And, and I, I also found myself thinking of um, the, the famous essay by Jay's colleague and, and mentor Richard White, Are You environmental, an Environmentalist or Do You Work for a Living? Um, that distinguishes between uh, some of us who may be ivy tower environmentalists and those people who actually work in the context of nature and how different their perspectives might be. And then I felt reassured by Peggy's comments about environmental psychology and Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, whose work I've often studied and used in my own discussions of literature, about how um, kind of reaffirming and, and nourishing our encounters with nature might be. And I wonder whether even those people who may work in very harsh conditions and direct exposure to the more difficult aspects of nature might also themselves recreate in nature or experience. I mean, what, what if, if the um, uh, um, meatpacking plant worker happened to have gall gallbladder surgery, would that person recover more readily in a room with a window looking out on a tree rather than a wall? You know, I think there, there may be some possibility of asking universal or making universal claims, um, even as we try to, to establish caveats and, and uh, limits to these universal claims that we make. Anyway, just a quick run through of a few of the many notes that I took listening to these speakers, and I wonder if the rest of you might have comments or questions you'd like to offer. Please use the microphone. Uh, my question is addressed to Ramesh. Uh, you mentioned RLC <coughs> has lost about 70 feet of its height due to the fact that the two rivers that ran into it, and I'm guessing that you are referring to Amu and Sir Darya, uh, are no longer pouring their 
and fluent into the sea, beside uh, evaporation and desiccation resulting from it. Uh, at the time of Alexander the Great, Amu Darya poured into the Caspian, not into the Aral. And in fact, Alexander traveled a great distance into the Central Asia towards India through the thing. Over the history, the course of the river has changed a couple times till its present situation that Khrushchev changed it for agriculture, growing cotton and the rest of the thing. Now, there's just nothing left of it. Now, human, uh, not human, but living things usually have a range, a somewhat limited range of a, uh, <coughs> conditions under which they can live. If you change it substantially, they <coughs> diminish. Now, RLC having lost that much water volumetrically, the <coughs> salinity of the water was substantially changed. What has that done to the remaining creatures there? Have they suffered substantially? And my second question is, has anybody studied that you know of what is happening to the salinity of the oceans as a whole, not the oral sea, but altogether? Uh, it seems like uh, you are very knowledgeable of that part of the work. I had a USAID project for four years, uh, so that is how I learned. Uh, from that experience. Uh, the first question is, uh, what has happened to the salinity of the RLC? Um, I think I give you one example because uh, when I heard that 70 feet of the ocean water has just disappeared, evaporated or didn't feed in, uh, the volume of the water shrank, so that ultimately increased the salinity level to two to three times more. Now, what they did to the, uh, the sea uh, community, the fishing industry was totally wiped out. There's absolutely no fishing industry left in the RLC. Uh, lots of other um, uh, water species, they disappeared. Uh, the air quality, because there were plenty of salt at sea, uh, I think the coastline dried out by almost four miles. So that salt became part of the air when the wind is blowing. It's a very dry area. So that was causing uh, impact on the human health. The water quality, which uh, was in that region, also was affecting the humans. Now, your second question is the broader aspects of the uh, salinity level in the ocean. We can look at Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic, Indian Ocean. I don't think uh, that has affected to that extent, I would say there's absolutely, well, I won't use the word absolutely, but not a change of that level. Now, Adel Sea was a landlocked sea water body. Now, these are other water bodies that are connected with each other. I was surprised to learn that uh, so-called nature literature is rather sparse, and it's only coming uh, into its own now. And I also reflected on the absence of uh, a counterpart to landscape in three-dimensional art. There isn't a figurative sculpture that is sculptural equivalent of landscape or a seascape. Um, arts tend to develop in parallel. Uh, why hasn't an ornamental literature uh, appeared and um, flourished, let's say in 17th century Holland, where the art of landscape was uh, very widespread and much praised. Why did it not uh, parallel the growth of Impressionist art in Europe in the second half of 19th century? Uh, when we look at the Eastern art, you know, if, you, if you look at the Chinese painting, then it's mostly uh, landscapes and, and uh, uh, a tender, philosophical, reflective view of, of uh, living and inanimate nature. Now, how about the Eastern literature? Have Chinese developed fiction and poetry uh, center and around nature, uh, commensurate with their interest in two-dimensional visual arts? Thanks. That's a uh, quite a fascinating question. I don't know enough about either Dutch or Chinese literature to be able to answer authoritatively. Uh, but I believe actually much of the European literature um, associated with the natural world. Um, is actually related to German Romanticism 
that so I believe there's a central European literature, uh, you know, that does um, explore the at least the visual experience of, of nature. I don't know that, that a kind of quote unquote ecological literature exists, you know, from the Renaissance era or the Romantic era in Central Europe, but uh, at least nature as landscape is explored in, in various German authors, you know, dating back uh, several centuries. Um, I don't know that much about Chinese language literature, but in, in Japan, there's a very long literature uh, associated with nature. When I taught at the University of Tokyo in the early 90s, traveling around lecturing usually about American environmental writing, I would always try to ferret out information about the Japanese literature of nature, and people would usually say, we have no such tradition, we don't, we don't have nature writing per se. So I'd say, do you have any literature about walking, about farming, about birds, about fishing? Um, and they'd say, well, of course, we have fish, uh, literature about whaling, you know, all the, they had very specific categories, entire vast categories of literature about bird watching, or about hiking, or, you know, experience of trees, or associated with Shinto religion. So it wasn't categorized necessarily as landscape literature or you know, nature writing, but certainly there was a vast body of literature. There, let me recommend a few books. There's one called Encompassing Nature, edited by Robert Torrance, a comparative literature scholar. A huge book, um, uh, and, and it, it covers a vast span of time and many different um, countries and many parts of the world. And then another book called The Literature of Nature, an international source book edited by Patrick Murphy, which includes uh, scholarly overviews of literatures from many parts of the world. Um, so these are two of the best introductions to international writing about nature that I know of. Why isn't there a sculptural equivalent to landscape and seascape painting? There's a sculptural equivalent to... Um, who's the fellow who's coming? Ned Kahn. Ned Kahn, yes. Um, and uh, who does some just incredible things um, dealing with nature scapes, if you want to put them that way. But they're sculptural, they're uh, uh, sculptural and uh, very active as well. Um, yeah. A um, couple of writers, Susie Gatwick and yeah. Lucy Lepard, they do have an overlay, and Lucy Lepard will be here in the spring. Both do a lot of talking about artists who work three dimensionally with the landscape. And oh, that's different. That's